Welcome to The Scientist Speaks, a podcast produced by the Scientist Creative Services team. Our podcast is by scientists and for scientists. Once a month, we bring you the stories behind newsworthy molecular biology research. This episode is brought to you by Axion Biosystems, whose innovative maestro platform effortlessly captures and quantifies complex biological functions. Whether modeling neurological disease or developing advanced cancer immunotherapies, the Maestro platform delivers sensitive real-time results to empower your research. Epilepsy is one of the most common neurological conditions affecting over 65 million individuals worldwide and is characterized by recurrent, spontaneous, and uncontrollable seizures. Seizures commonly arise in the epileptic brain after a sudden burst in neurological activity. While many anti-epileptic drugs control seizures, one-third of patients with epilepsy fail to respond to them. Managing drug-resistant epilepsy poses a challenge to scientists and clinicians alike. In this episode, narrated by Nikki Spahich, Sejal Davla from the Scientist Creative Services team, spoke with Evangelos Kiskenis, an assistant professor at Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine, about his work modeling drug-resistant epilepsies using induced pluripotent stem cells, which offers novel disease management solutions that could translate to the clinic. Epilepsy encompasses multiple syndromes that have neurobiological, cognitive, psychological, and social consequences for patients, and may include developmental brain defects. Clinicians diagnose and characterize epilepsy based on how and where abnormal brain activity occurs. For example, primary generalized seizures arise in most brain areas at once, whereas localized or focal seizures are restricted to a single brain region. Patients experiencing seizures have different symptoms depending on the brain regions involved. Focal seizures cause involuntary jerking of body parts, such as the arms and legs, or briefly suspended sensations like taste and smell. Generalized seizures impair consciousness, which could have devastating consequences for the person experiencing them. Because of this, timely diagnosis and treatment are crucial for epilepsy patients. However, an epilepsy diagnosis requires a battery of tests because the cause and the occurrence of seizures vary wildly. People that suffer from epilepsy don't have seizures that often. That creates some complications in terms of clinical diagnosis and treatment. So to diagnose somebody, you have to keep them in the hospital. Typical diagnosis for epilepsy includes typical neurological exams. It may include brain imaging such as MRIs or CT scans. And sometimes it may include neuropsychological tests. Seizures are diagnosed with a brain electroencephalogram, known as an EEG, during which the clinicians will attach electrodes on intact skull, and the electrodes record the electrical activity of one's brain based on that electrical activity. Epileptologists can diagnose seizures and types of seizures. There are several known forms of epilepsy. Hereditary epilepsy, where proteins responsible for keeping the brain's electrical activity synchronized are mutated, is relatively easy to diagnose with genetic testing and disease biomarker identification. Brain injury and infection are also leading causes of epilepsy. However, for 70% of epilepsy patients, the cause is unknown. Because most epilepsies have undetermined causes, choosing the right kind of treatment is complicated. Anti-epileptic or deconvulsant medications which stop seizures are common treatment options. These drugs either decrease excitation or enhance inhibition of neuronal signaling. Clinicians prescribe medications by taking into consideration a variety of factors, such as the seizure type, medical comorbidities, patient age, and drug side effects. Identifying the right drug or drug cocktail that successfully stops seizures is a challenging task. Clinicians resort to a trial and error approach, as it is hard to predict how a patient will respond to a particular line of therapy. The trial and error approach is not as simple as it sounds. It's not like one drug doesn't work, the clinician could give you another one. Typically, you have to wean off individuals from drug A and put them on drug B. You have to try different concentrations. It's a long and protracted process. It might take a substantial amount of time before one would know whether a drug is effective because you're looking at the rate of seizures over a course of time. 
the types of pediatric epilepsies are very aggressive, very early onset types of epilepsies. We're talking about cases where kids are born and within a few hours they're seizing. And it is at that point that a clinician tries to therapeutically treat these kids and stop them from seizing as soon as possible. So in those cases, you would know almost immediately whether a patient responds to a drug. In certain hereditary epilepsy cases, clinicians know the causative genes, so they can prescribe drugs based on the genetic diagnosis. For example, pediatric disorders such as KCNQ2 epilepsy and Dravet syndrome are caused by a single mutation in a potassium channel gene or a sodium channel gene, respectively. Dysfunctional potassium and sodium channels predispose brain cells to generate excessive neuronal activity, which causes seizures. Therefore, clinicians can quickly prescribe treatments that address these defects by balancing ion concentrations. Genetic screening has only been established in recent years, can definitely facilitate drug selection. For example, KCNQ2 developmental epileptic encephalopathy, which is a disease we're focused on, these children benefit by being treated with sodium channel blockers. In contrast, you wouldn't treat a Dravet patient who has a sodium channel haploid sufficiency with a sodium channel block. However, we have to remember that genetic epilepsy represents a small proportion of all epilepsy cases. The ion channel associated epilepsies represent only about 50% of all known genetic cases. It still is a small proportion relative to the overall population of epilepsy. So, so genetic screening does help, but it only helps a small proportion of the population. Despite best efforts, one third of all epilepsy patients fail to respond to currently available anti epileptic drugs for unknown reasons. These drug resistant patients continue to have seizures and have high mortality rates. This includes patients with certain forms of genetic epilepsies, such as benign familial neonatal convulsion disorder, a type of KCNQ2 epilepsy. In cases where the drugs cannot control seizures, the only treatment option may be invasive surgery. However, despite well documented success stories, not all patients can have the surgery. First, identifying the affected brain location in focal epilepsy requires additional expensive tests, such as functional MRI, which detects changes in blood flow and metabolism. In addition, surgery is possible only if seizures originate in a well-defined brain region that doesn't contribute to vital functions such as speech, language, and movement. Lastly, there are considerable post-surgical risks, including cognitive and memory decline. Therefore, researchers are devising better approaches for predicting successful drug combinations and for testing new drugs to treat drug-resistant patients. To tackle the challenges associated with treating genetically and symptomatically heterogeneous epilepsy, including drug resistance, researchers set out to develop new models to understand the origins and characteristics of these disorders. Researchers currently use fly, zebrafish, and mouse models to investigate neuronal networks in the brain and identify new drug targets to fix epileptic neuronal activity. In addition, non-neuronal cell lines that overexpress mutant ion channels or other proteins causing epilepsy are well-suited for screening novel drug compounds. However, the knowledge generated from these models does not always translate to patients. Advancements in patient-derived induced pluripotent stem cells, IPCs or IPSCs, are becoming the preferred system for epilepsy research over traditional models. IPSCs are generated directly from a patient's somatic cells, such as skin cells, and are then differentiated into neuronal cell types of interest in the laboratory. Is that induced pluripotent stem cells offer some unique advantages that they recapitulate each patient's unique genetic makeup? They reflect the physiology of human rather than animal neurons or even non-neuronal cells often been used to perform drug screening in preclinical work. We should not underestimate the contribution of genetics and human-specific physiology. Some of the recent work that is driven by the Allen Brain Institute on the comparison of human and mammalian brains are clearly highlighting critical distinctive features of ion channels, as an example in where and when they're expressed within cells or within the brain, and as well as the combination of channels that are expressed at any given developmental time point. But some of the proof principle studies that have been reported, including some of our work on KCNQ2 developmental epilepsy, are promising in terms of the ability of IPC models to recapitulate clinical features of epilepsy. A million-dollar question for researchers using IPSC-derived neurons is what epilepsy looks like in a dish. 
After faithfully recapitulating human physiology, the goal of researchers is to develop an IPSC epilepsy model and identify patient-specific epileptic phenotypes, such as direct changes in electrical activity. The brain uses a range of excitatory and inhibitory chemicals whose levels are tightly balanced. When an imbalance causes higher excitation in a patient, seizures occur. Neuroscientists use several tools to measure changes in neuronal activity frequency and magnitude to identify hyperexcitability in the brain, such as patch clamp electrophysiology, multi-electrode array, calcium imaging, and the optogenetic-based tool OptoPatch. There's been a, a false expectation that we would see hyperexcitable neurons or seizing neurons in, in a culture dish. In our experience, epilepsy in a dish tends to look more like a network imbalance or an alteration in the firing features of patient neurons, such as increased bursting or altered action potential properties. The advantage of this is that we can record from literally thousands of neurons with single cell resolution in a very short period of time. Using a combination of these methods, we and others have reported distinct features of epileptic IPC-derived patient neurons relative to control ones. We found that IPC-derived neurons from patients with potassium channel mutations exhibit burst suppression behavior on a multi-electrode array platform that's highly reminiscent of what is seen in the respective EEG patterns of the same individuals. Because the cause of so many epilepsy cases is undetermined, Researchers found that studying neurons alone in cell culture is insufficient. Beyond looking at neuronal firing phenotypes, researchers aim to understand epilepsy in the context of the whole brain. Many epilepsy researchers focus their work on iPSC-derived cortical neurons that resemble neurons in the human cortex, a brain region where seizures typically occur. However, the brain is composed of several molecular and functionally distinct cell types. Genetic aberrations or injury in any of these cells or aberrant communication between them could cause hyperexcitability in the brain. Moreover, while seizures are acute, epilepsy is a chronic condition accompanied by several neurodevelopmental and neurological hallmarks. To investigate cellular changes in epilepsy brains, researchers started growing 3D brain organoids from patient-derived iPSCs that incorporate other brain cell types. Cortical neurons, including excitatory inhibitory subtypes, are likely the drivers of epilepsy. However, the contribution of non-neuronal cells like astrocytes, microglial cells is likely. We do have methods that allow us to now make non-neuronal subtypes of the central nervous system like astrocytes, microglials, and others, either in isolation as well as in the context of organoids. Three-dimensional aggregates of IPC-differentiated cells that intriguingly recapitulate many spatiotemporal features of the developing human brain. Some of the most exciting works in this area comes from Sergio Pasca and his group at Stanford, where they've managed to make regional brain organoids and fuse them to create so-called assembloids. I think these models could prove to be instrumental in the investigation of particularly the neurodevelopmental comorbidities associated with epilepsy. I think we can even model injury-induced or injury-associated epilepsy, where we can actually physically injure either two-dimensional cultures or even three-dimensional organoids. And the hope is that it will allow us to execute drug screening campaigns in the context of patient-specific individual neurons. iPSC-derived two-dimensional cell culture and three-dimensional brain organoid epilepsy models are becoming more sophisticated as technology advances, paving the way for their use in therapeutic applications. Epilepsy researchers seek to replace the trial and error strategy used by clinicians with personalized drug screens for patients. iPSC-derived brain cells allow researchers to investigate cellular, molecular, and electrophysiological properties of epilepsy that are unique to each patient. By screening for drugs in iPSC-derived neurons, researchers will be able to predict if a patient will experience drug resistance to existing anti-epileptic drugs. They will also use this technology to accelerate new drug screening efforts for drug-resistant patients. The last 10 years, the broader field of iPSC-based technology has focused on the development of proof-of-principle models of neurological, neurodevelopmental, and neurodegenerative diseases. We and others in the field have established standard quality control measurements that, that one needs to consider before employing you know, large-scale drug screening approaches using iPSC-derived neurons. The highest utility right now is 
in helping us investigate disease mechanisms or biological responses to particular types of drugs. Thank you for listening to The Scientist Speaks. This episode was produced by the Creative Services team for The Scientist and narrated by Nikki Spahij. And thanks to Axion Biosystems for sponsoring this episode. Please join us next month as we learn about designing minimal synthetic cells. To keep up to date with this podcast, follow The Scientist on Facebook and Twitter and subscribe wherever you get your podcast.